So Todd is here to ease us into the warm waters of BC fishing, and that was the idea. So Todd, you may take it away. But I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit, just to uh, explain a bit of my background. Um, I'm, I'm a member of uh, Team Canada, as Brian mentioned, and the president of Fly Fishing Canada. Uh, I am not really myself what I'd consider a competitive person, but I've really enjoyed being part of the competitive fly fishing uh, world. Uh, the community is, is huge. Uh, it's been a great opportunity to meet a lot of other anglers uh, and a lot of them I call good friends now, um, and also to travel and see parts of the world. Uh, the biggest advantage I've found as a fly fisher, uh, like many of you, um, I'm like a sponge. I just want to learn as much as I can. I want to uh, take it to a different level. Some, some anglers are happy just trolling around, uh, you know, a good old Doc Spratly or whatever other pattern they have, and that's fly fishing to them, and I totally accept and uh, appreciate that. Uh, but for me, um, I, I kind of take it to a different level, being that I'm always trying to uh, look for innovative ways that I can improve my performance to uh, also to improve my fly tying and my patterns. So being part of the competitive world has given me the opportunity and avenue to do that and pursue it. Um, I've been fortunate to have met a lot of uh, superb anglers around the world and have a chance to learn from some of the best, as far as what I consider coaches that are out there uh, learning river techniques and lakes uh, being from BC, uh, my upbringing with, with fishing uh, started with worms like everybody else, I'm sure, on here. Uh, I didn't have a mentor in fly fishing. So fly fishing, when I did start, I was totally new to it. And it was a great experience. And I fell in love with it immediately um, once I took a course and realized that there was actually a science behind it. And it could be become whatever I wanted it to become, simple or complex. I chose the road to make it complex. Uh, because I really wanted to learn more about uh, not only fly fishing itself, but about the insects and the whole ecology that's involved with it. Uh, this, in my opinion, gave me a great start studying entomology and understanding what the patterns were supposed to represent was a big advantage. Uh, here in BC, uh, for those of you that fish uh, other provinces in Canada, you realize that we have a single fly only rule. Uh, that offers challenges, but also it offers many rewards. I think the one thing that it does, it allows fly fish to become a simple uh, activity, being that you're not so worried about trying to mix up and figure out the dried droppers and which patterns work great together. But it, it allowed me to uh, just focus on one pattern at a time. As a competitive angler traveling and fishing the world, we fish multiple patterns at numerous world championships and uh, other events that I've been to. But again, uh, there's many times when it just comes down to a single pattern can be more effective. Uh, reason being that sometimes if you're fishing a fishery where there's a lot of pressure, the fish become educated and they, they understand and they see these uh, team of flies coming through the water. So sometimes switching to just a single uh, presentation or a single fly can give you the advantage of uh, being able to act more like a natural presentation, which you're accustomed to eating. Uh, you have to keep in mind that for a trout to become of any sort of size, it's digested and it's eaten numerous uh, insects, uh, aquatic and terrestrial. So they do understand what it is that they have to eat and through just uh, the nature, they're predatory. So uh, they're always watching for something. So again, Going back uh, to a single fly new, many times uh, can be way more effective uh, than trying to do numerous patterns, you know, where you're fishing multiples like blobs and boobies, which is a big trend. Uh, I'm not sure if you're using them back there, but I, for example, I've fished many times where those patterns can be very effective, uh, primarily for stock fish. Uh, but when it comes down to in BC trying to uh, have a good results, I find fishing more natural patterns to what the fish are accustomed to eat to represent those food sources uh, can be more effective. Uh, just a few tips uh, that I'd like to try and share with you today too is one of the biggest ones uh, because I understand some of the anglers are fairly new to the sport uh, but there's a few things that I always try to uh, in enforce and try to uh, emphasize to new anglers is if you're going on the water first thing you need is make sure you've got good polarized sunglasses uh, or clip-ons. 
Uh, I can't stress enough the advantage that you'll have when you can actually see through the glare in the water and be able to uh, spot or watch or see fish or even identify uh, different uh, structures that might attract the fish. If you're wearing polarized glasses, uh, which is key to wear regardless, even for safety, but you'll have a chance to actually see the fish. And this slide here, this is a picture I took uh, with my tripod. There's actually uh, three fish in here in this uh, area on the gravel. Uh, I basically took two pictures and uh, put the two together. But on the left, you can see with the polarized lens, you can identify that fish that the arrow is on. But to the right, without the uh, lens, there's actually two fish. There's one beside it and one further ahead. This will give you an idea again of the, the benefit of wearing a polarized uh, lens. So you don't necessarily have to run out and buy the most expensive Maui gyms. Um, as far as fishing in BC, uh, being a single fly only province, uh, we, we tend to uh, focus a lot more on floating lines, clear intermediates and fast sinking lines. What they do is this allows you to cover the water column. Uh, as you're aware, most of you probably understand that trout uh, don't necessarily just stay near the surface or at the bottom uh, throughout the day and throughout the year. They're traveling throughout the water column to try to find as much food as they can or even to seek comfort. Uh, so by having different sinking lines and also floating lines, it allows you to, to try to probe the water and try to understand at what depth the fish are at. A uh, common question that people ask me is what's my favorite pattern or if I'm having success on the water and they're not. Uh, but typically that's the wrong question is not to ask what pattern. It should be asking what sinking line or what depth are you finding the fish. Uh, in reality, uh, the key is to find the fish, find the depth, understand where they're at. By having the full range of sinking lines, it can allow you to uh, suspend your fly and present it at that depth in the water column a little bit longer but it can also help to speed up the process. If you're using a faster sinking line, you can sweep your fly through the water column. So you tend to want to um, find a depth first for the fish to understand um, where they are. Then you can experiment with patterns. Uh, many times I've been in a boat with my, my kids or friends or even in competitions where the key was to find the depth of the fish, the right fly, the right fly line, and then the patterns, but I've sat side by side with other anglers that have had just as good of success, uh, good or bad, uh, with different patterns. So again, it's not so much the pattern. If, if you're trying to identify what's going to make your time on water a bit more effective, for, focus first on the depth and the sinking line or floating line, and then work on your patterns. Um, typically, when I fish with my kids, this part of my process, when I do go fishing, I keep journals and I try to take notes and that whether it's mental or on my computer or on my phone, uh, just so that I can reproduce that when I go back another day or another time and come across the same sort of circumstances or uh, conditions, it'll kind of help to speed up the uh, process of trying to find fish and find success. Um, other, other key uh, tip is, is your, with your leader. Um, a lot of lot of people will uh, kind of debate back and forth on fluorocarbon and copolymer or monofilament, if you'd call it. Uh, with a sinking line, if you look into my my fly uh, case, you're going to find nothing but fluorocarbon in there. Uh, also, uh, the fly shops tend to hate it when I do presentations and talk about it. But this is sort of a comparison. Uh, with monofilament uh, being Maxima Ultra Green, which I'm not sure if it's popular back where you are, but in British Columbia, that was sort of the go-to uh, leader material for many years uh, due to some of the television shows and just popularity and supply and demand. Uh, but a lot of anglers that are using monofilament even still today on a sinking line just don't really understand the advantage, not just the low stretch and lower visibility, but the strength per pound test or diameter um, ratio uh, is, is, is pretty impressive. If you're, if you're to take a look at the, uh, for example, the 5X uh, Ultra Green, the same diameter in comparison, you're moving from three pound breaking strength in, in monofilament. If you're using that exact same diameter, in uh, fluorocarbon, 
you're getting almost double. You're at five pound breaking strength. This is this can be very important in the case of where you're doing small nymphs or you're presenting something almost near static, is to try to uh, have it less visible. Um, and again, it was just a chart that I'd done up for a comparison to show or illustrate. When you go down to 2X, if you're fishing some uh, for salmon, for example, or you're fishing for larger trout where you've got to beef it up, if you're comfortable using a 2X, uh, six pound uh, ultra green maxima or monofilament, by going to fluorocarbon for most of them, you're almost doubling your breaking strength. So again, it could be a very important uh, aspect of not breaking off fish, but also having a little more uh, stealthy presentation. Uh, nice thing about fluorocarbon too, is that it has a low stretch factor, uh, being that if you were to take, uh, yeah, eight, eight or nine foot length of uh, fluorocarbon and compare it to monofilament. Just give it a pull and you'll see that there's a bit more give on it. Uh, nice thing with, with the having less stretch is that when you do hook a fish, it's going to have you, um, it's going to give you a better ability to actually set the hook, especially on bigger fish where their mouths tend to be a little bit tougher to sink a hook into. Uh, so again, the fluorocarbon is going to give you a bit of an edge that way. Uh, with the sinking lines um, backing up a little bit, uh, I tend to use the low stretch sinking lines. Uh, for a floating line, I want to have a little bit of give just for shock absorption. But if I'm stripping or even hand twisting or figure eighting, as some call it, um, a pattern through the water, I want to make sure that I don't have a lot of stretch in between. So I've got a more direct uh, contact with my fly for sensitivity, but again, also for the hook set. Uh, other thing that's really important uh, tip that I'd like to share is understanding how a fish takes a fly. If you've ever seen any underwater photography, uh, I've done some filming with GoPros and just uh, swimming and observing. But uh, if you ever see a fish, how it actually takes a, a subsurface fly, when they swim up behind it, they, they basically drop the, mouth, the floor of their mouth cavity and they flare their mouth so they can actually draw or suck the water and the food source into their mouth. Um, it's very interesting if you had a chance to see it or Google it, just, just Google it to understand how they take it. This is quite common when people are in a boat, whether you're trolling or whether you're uh, retrieving your fly, especially at slower speeds. Sometimes you feel a little tap, tap, tap or a bump, something feels strange. Uh, instinct or first reaction for a lot of anglers is to raise a rod and try to set the hook. Uh, but what I found out and what I was coached at was to ignore and resist the temptation to react. When it, whenever you feel that, it means that the fish are actually behind your fly. They're coming behind it and they're trying to suck it in. So sometimes it's just even just that slight sucking or they may, might not have got it fully in and bumped it with their lips. So uh, try to ignore when you feel bumps um, and let the fish finally realize that it's got to speed up and accelerate to take it. Uh, in a normal situation, a fish is, you know, eating thousands, in some cases, millions of insects in the water. Uh, their typical situation is they swim up behind it and they suck it in. But in the case of fly fishing, when you've got the tension of the fly line, the leader, your retrieve, when they swim up to suck your fly into their mouth, they can't actually pull it in because there's a resistance of all the, uh, that you have that's going all the way down to the fly. So they'll try and suck it multiple times. So you might feel a little tap tap or a bump bump. If you've got real sensitive lines, you'll know what I mean. So again, if you resist it, eventually the fish realizes he can't suck it in. So he's going to accelerate and hammer it, uh, move in on it and actually engulf the fly. Uh, we learned this lesson pretty quick many, many years ago in Scotland. Uh, we were fishing on Loch Leven with our guide who was coaching us uh, on Loch style fishing at the time. And he basically uh, brought home the point to us. Uh, I know my team captain at the time, he was stripping and he got a bump bump and he set, set his hook. He missed the fish, the, the ghillie or guide. He right away said, uh, said, do not react. He said, just keep stripping keep stripping, keep the retrieve con constant and it'll take it. Um, he did it again. He was stripping and then the same thing happened again and he missed it. And I was chuckling to myself because I wasn't doing the same thing, but I wasn't getting these follows or bites. So uh, next thing you know, I did the same thing. I, I had the same reaction and I 
pulled and I missed a fish. Uh, the, the guide pulled out a fish bonker or priest as he called it. And he said, okay, boys, he says, the next time one of you does that, you're getting this across your knuckles. <laughs> so uh, it was a great lesson because we were petrified at that point of getting this brass uh, priest put across our knuckles. So we, we stopped doing the typical reaction and our, our fish count went up significantly. Um, <laughs> almost doubled our, our catch for that day. So again, it was just something that was nice to learn and to try to pass on to other people. I always try to uh, emphasize to people that if you're having those sort of short takes too, sometimes it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the pattern I've, I've seen people try to take, say, for example, a woolly bugger that has a long tail they think it's nipping on the back end. So they'll cut the tail shorter thinking that it'll bring it closer to the fly. But in this case, again, it'll, it could change the action or the movement of the fly. So it's important if you, if you're having a reaction or follows play around with your retrieve or uh, again, just pause and give, give some chances for the fish to actually uh, take the fish to fly in. Uh, other thing that happens in the case of, of a take, is you'll notice a lot of times that people will strip and they'll think they have a fish and they lift the rod. They'll, they'll lift it up to set the hook. Uh, it's one of the things you really want to avoid doing. In this case, what you're doing is if the fish is following behind your fly, as I mentioned, trying to suck that fly in, by lifting your rod, you've instantly pulled your fly through the water uh, anywhere from nine to 12 feet away from that fish in a split second. Uh, any fish that it's in the water, I guarantee you, is not going to chase after it. It's going to be startled and turned off. Instead, what you should do is just carry on your retrieve. If you feel any tension, then give it a strip strike, just basically pulling with your hand, uh, not lift the rod. As soon as you feel the tension or the weight of the fish, then lift your rod. Uh, other thing you'll see, uh, and probably a few have experienced it too, is quite often people are, are stripping, retrieving their fly through the water. Uh, they, they have a fish on, they're playing it, and they lose it. Um, I learned this a long time ago at, through tournaments, just really trying to pay attention and, and sort of analyze and dissect what I did wrong or what my boat partner's done wrong. A uh, big, big mistake that they do is they go right from the retrieve to playing a fish, is once you've, once you've hooked the fish, is to set the hook. Um, bigger fish, it's really important. Small ones, it's still, still important to do it. But bigger fish, uh, what I usually do is if when I retrieve, do a strip strike, I can feel the fishes on there. Instead of just playing it, I'll actually give, pump the rod two or three times real hard to make sure that I've set that hook. If you're using a quality hook, you shouldn't have a problem with this. Uh, if you're bending your hook and you're losing them, I'd recommend you go to stronger hooks. I learned very quickly uh, and I rarely do that anymore unless I'm trying to uh, cover a rising fish or a fish I've spotted. I try to hang it, as you would say, the terminology is, is hanging your fly. What this does is at the end of the retrieve, it allows a fish that might have been following, but maybe there's something that wasn't quite right, or maybe it wasn't quite um, in the mood to attack your fly. But, but just doing that pause and slowly elevating your rod to make the fly rise to the water column. Uh, when we do the hang, a lot of the fly lines now uh, actually have what they call hang markers on the sinking lines. Um, uh, but basically the last 20 feet of your fly line from the tip, what I do if I have a sinking line that doesn't have a hang marker on it, I actually will take and uh, take fly tying thread and just make, make uh, several wraps and then tie it off and then I'll coat it with some uh, uh, Loon Outdoors Knot Sense or even just nail polish. It'll make a little bump that's colored, you know, use fluorescent orange or chartreuse, but it'll allow you to identify in your hand, you will feel when you're coming towards the end of the retrieves, when you got 20 feet of fly line out and when to start the hang. Uh, they, they actually market it and sell them and call them as hang markers on the fly lines. It's built into them on Rio and on Airflow. I don't believe Scientific Angler has uh, developed that yet or marketed it yet, but it makes a big difference if you uh, have those on there because again, you can recognize that your fly is coming too close to the boat and it's time to actually start the hang or uh, to pause your retrieve. Uh, all that being said is, is if you do, if you are retrieving your fly and you see a fish move or rise, 
I pull up my fly immediately and cast to it. I mean, there's no sense trying to, uh, to find fish when you can see fish. Uh, as far as covering fish, uh, rising fish, the uh, methodology that I use for it is if I see a rise and I'm in my boat or even on the shore, typically I'll, I'll cast from the ring, never cast right on the ring unless you're right on it, like in a split second and your fly is in the air. But if you see a rise, cast five feet short of it between you and the, the rise, five feet short and begin your retrieve. Uh, give it about 10 seconds. If nothing's happened, cast depending on which side the shore is on uh, or if there's structure. I'll cast typically 10 feet to the right, to the center of the rise, uh, just in case the fish has actually swam off to the right in instead of towards me. And then if there's no reaction or I missed it, I'll pull in my fly real quickly and then I'll cast, uh, in this case, uh, 15 feet to the left. Perhaps it's moved that direction and I'll retrieve it for a bit. And then I will cast 20 to 25 feet directly over the ring to see if uh, the fish maybe was swimming away from me. Uh, other thing that's important too is if you're fishing dry flies, uh, rivers or lakes, uh, is to understand or do a little bit of research is to look uh, into what they call the snail circle. Um, this is basically when the trout are underwater looking up, they don't see a clear window above them. There's sort of a, a sort of a circle of vision that they can see above them. Anything that's within that vision, they can see completely clear, but anything that's outside at any distance away from them at, a, at an angle, they're basically gonna only see what's underneath or in the water surface. So uh, when I am fishing dry flies, I prefer to have flies that actually sink or sit lower in the water. Uh, ginking up a fly or tying patterns with great hackle on the back and the, around the collar uh, look impressive, but in my mind, they're less effective because all the fish would see is maybe a little bit of a footprint from the hackle sitting on them. So uh, using patterns, uh, it's, the clink hammer is a great one. Uh, CDC pattern, dry flies. Uh, a lot of it, what makes them most so effective is the fact that they sit in the water surface so the fish can see them at greater distances. I, so not having done a lot of lake fishing, um, I guess it's something that's not that commonly done in Ontario. If you're on a lake and you know there's trout in that lake and you don't really know the bottom and it just kind of looks like a big flat lake, like where do you start or how do you start? Uh, that's a great question, Dean. Um, and I think that's one that plagues a lot of anglers uh, new to the sport and, and season. Uh, typically what I do when I go to a lake, let's say I'm going to a new lake I've never fished. Uh, what I, what I'll typically, typically do is I'll go on Google earth. It's a great resource to identify, to look at the lake from above, understand maybe where there could be a weed bed, or maybe there's a, you know, a drop off where the water drops from a shallower depth to greater depth, uh, or else maybe there's, there's just a, a inflowing Creek or a river. All those things would track fish. Um, so if, if I'm going to a lake that I, I don't understand and I don't know, I try to do that research ahead of time. Uh, also, a lot of uh, in BC, we're fortunate to have a, a quite a category of, or catalog of um, maps of the lakes. That's where I'm going to go. Also, key is to watch if you see um, swallows or birds that are flying or feeding above the water head to that area there's a hatch going on something's drawing the fish and the birds that if the f birds are doing that above you can almost guarantee the fish are doing something similar down below as the uh, as of insects are emerging and coming up from the bottom whether they're coming out of the mud or, or else from uh, vegetation the fish are picking them off and then once they hit the surface and emerge then the birds are picking them off so again you might be a little bit too late if the birds are too high but if they're swooping close to the surface Keep an eye out for that at all times. It's a, a great way to find and identify where the fish are. Todd, I've got another question for you. Uh, out in Ontario, we don't tend to fish the dragonflies, but you mentioned gomphus. Can you talk to us a little bit about gomphus? Yeah, the gomphus, if you come to British Columbia, you have to have a gomphus in your fly selection. <laughs> it's, it's probably one of the most effective patterns. Uh, in my mind, if I'm going to a lake in BC and I don't know what to use or where the fish are, 
quite often I'll put a gonfus on. It's basically a deer hair pattern. It's spun deer hair that's trimmed to the shape of almost like a double-ended bullet. Um, and it has on the side, it'll have pheasant tail that it'll sort of flare out as, as wings or legs on the side. Uh, if you Google Gonfus BC, you'll, you'll find it. <laughs> uh, but again, it's it's a great pattern because it's it's very visible. It's it's somewhat buoyant. It's similar to uh, like a booby reaction. If you're stripping it on a sinking line and you pause, they don't necessarily dip and dive, but they kind of tend to stay at the same depth. Or if you do a long pause, they will slowly move up. Uh, if you've ever talked to people and they talk about the booby pattern, They'll, they'll say how it dips and dives when you pause. If you ever watched it, and I've swam in the water and watched it and taken pictures, but they don't. They just basically go along. They're, they're sort of neutral density or buoyant, but they're not going to dip and dive like people think they would do. Uh, they tend to go along because there's tension between the, the pattern and the fly line with the leader. There's, there's always tension, so they're not freely floating. If you pause and left it completely free, it might. But overall, as you're retrieving a fly through the water, it's the sinking line is constantly sinking uh, unless you're pulling it fast, which will keep it up. So the gonfus is, is very effective in that sense that it has that ability to sort of hover or stay at the same depth that the uh, fly line is at. So Todd, when you're yes. talking about the, it's Brian, when you're talking about the booby pattern again, and that resistance, is that coming because of the sponge that's tied at the front of it and the, just the tension on it that'll keep it straight across? Yeah, you know, and, and the other problem with the, the booby fly is that uh, a lot of anglers uh, will find that the fish swallow it very deeply. Uh, same thing can be with the gonfus too, just being that it's more buoyant. Uh, fish will suck them in deeper. I don't know if there was a slide there or not that showed that. Um, I can't tell what all you had, but basically uh, with a booby, the, it's a wide pattern. Uh, if you're retrieving it very slowly, what will happen is the fish, when they do that sucking action I talked about, because of it being more uh, surface, it tends to get sucked deeper back into their gill rakers. Uh, if you're ever fishing with a booby or a gonfus or any big bushy pattern, you'll notice that they get stuck in the gill rakers, fish bleed out and die. Uh, some competitions or fisheries actually in the UK ban the booby because of fish mortality. Uh, you'll notice if you ever fish chronomids or real sparse nymphs, rarely do you get them back in the gill rake. A reason being is that when the fish do that sucking action, there's not as big of a mass, so they can't draw them as far back into their throat cavity or, or towards the uh, gill rakers. So again, if you are using a booby and you're finding problems with mortality, stop using it and go to something that's a little more sparse or significantly re speed up your retrieve, retrieve to keep that tension so the fish can't draw it back into their gill rakers. So it's so one of those patterns that I don't like to use a lot in the sense that uh, it, it can be a bit of a fish killer if you don't use it right. So that's a great tip. As long as we're talking about materials uh, through chat, uh, Bruce uh, Gudmundson has a question for us. But uh, my question is about UV materials when it comes to fly tying. How valuable are they, especially in low light, uh, or are they just a lot of hype? You know, th there is a bit of hype with it too. Um, I, I think what, what happens overall is a pattern can be very effective and people can lean toward direction and say, okay, there's UV in it, so that's why it's effective. Uh, but that certainly can be not the case in some patterns that have UV in them and they can make them more effective or more visible. Uh, with UV, there's, there's a bit of a debate about how much UV trout can detect. Um, there's some research that I've, that I've done and I've read different papers that show that there's a certain percentage of it that they retain, that they can see more UV when they're small or juvenile fish, but as they get older, it deteriorates. But the, the key is, is that uh, UV, sometimes it provides a hot spot. Uh, UV can be different than fluorescent. A lot of people mix the two up and they talk about fluorescent as being UV. Uh, it certainly has UV qualities in fluorescent like materials and that can make it more, more effective, but it comes down to, uh, in the case of greater depths, uh, the UV characteristics of patterns allows them to be seen at greater depths and at greater distance. Uh, problem with water is that it absorbs light, 
Uh, if you've ever done any diving, those that do diving and have maybe taken underwater photography, you'll, you'll find that colors fade out. Uh, there's that fade, which everybody now knows about. Uh, when I started researching, not a lot of people spoke about it, but uh, it's, it's also horizontally. It's just not uh, vertically. So if you want to have a pattern, it's more effective uh, at a greater distance uh, horizontally, which in the case is, is more important in, in rivers than it is with the depth. Adding fluorescent material to your pattern could be more effective than UV. Uh, UV, a greater depth in the water can do uh, wonders, but uh, overall, I'm more of a believer in adding the fluorescent than the UV as being the, the significant fat pattern, especially in lake fishing. Uh, but that being said, my vampire leech is probably one of the more effective patterns I use, but that combines fluorescent and UV in it. If it were just one or the other, I think it, it would still produce, but uh, the combination of having a fluorescent bead makes, makes it far more visible to the trout vertically and horizontally. Obviously, if they're uh, above the fly, they're not going to dive at great depths down to retrieve it. Uh, so again, if it's above them and you're using a pattern against the skylight, uh, it's not going to be quite as visible or, or, you know, the contrast isn't necessarily going to be there. But by using a black UV, which I use in my case for the vampire, uh, it gives you the, the, the advantage of having that profile or silhouette from above being recognizable uh, sideways for that prolonged uh, uh, visibility in the water the fluorescent helps for that and again at greater depths it's a combination of both the fluorescent and the uv that adds to it so trying to play or play around with patterns by adding uv do you have a favorite hook manufacturer and do you wrap your sinking hook with lead or use a separate um shot i think he's talking split shot um i i don't use split shot and i don't use wrap for any of my lake patterns uh, if I want it to get down faster, I use tungsten. Uh, if you were to look in my, my lake box, uh, you'll find tungsten and brass just being shallower presentations, uh, prolonged, you know, long casts over a shoal where it's, you know, maybe a three, three to six foot depth. Um, obviously, the tungsten is going to hit the bottom too fast, snag up or drag or be below the, the fish. So again, uh, I'll have multiple of each pattern tied up, some with tungsten, some with, with uh, lead or brass, and some just unweighted uh, with glass beads. Yes, actually uh, jig hooks I've been using for many years. Um, that was one of the secrets that we had for the 2016 Commonwealth Championships uh, when it came to Canada. We were using jig hooks on our all of our lake patterns. Uh, reason being that we found they had a better hookup ratio, uh, being that the hook is riding pointed up, it also eliminates or reduces your chance of snagging the bottom. If you fish a lot of rivers, uh, you can appreciate jig hooks in the sense that when they ride up, you're not bumping rocks, you're not dulling it. When I fish a competition, I could fish for a three hour session with the same, uh, say a pheasant tail nymph or a hare's ear nymph, if it's tied on a jig hook, I don't even have to stop to sharpen it. I never, I don't even carry a hook sharpener anymore. Okay. Um, oh, so I've got a really poignant question coming from Bruce, and then I'm going to circle back to David Williams after that. Uh, what, and Bruce can add anything to it as he wants. What is the single most wisdom that you have experienced as a fly fisher? Um, always come home in time for supper. Oh, <laughs> no, one uh, more cast, last cast. Yes, no, you, you, you know what? Um, that one last cast thing, we all do that, but you know what? I, I, I tend to, my one thing of wisdom that I could share is that it's not all about size. It's not all about quantity. It's uh, as I always say at all the events that I put on, uh, the biggest winner is the person with the biggest smile. Oh my gosh. I'm going to add marriage counselor to your bio now, <laughs> okay, among other things. <laughs> That's a very good one. Um, I think this one is coming from David because it's coming up with Isaac Walton. How do you approach a foam line on a stream? Foam line on a stream? Uh, boy, boy. Um, 
I typically would go through that with a dry fly first. Uh, I would stand below it and I would try to uh, just dead drip the dry through it. If nothing happens, I haven't offended any fish that might have been lower down. So then I, I might actually go through it with a bit of a wet fly and try to cover just subsurface. Uh, if that's not working and the fish are obviously maybe not rising, then I'll go through it with a, with a lightly weighted nymph. And then eventually I'll go through it with a real heavy bomb to see if they're sitting on the very bottom to looking up. But again, I, I go through it. I wouldn't just naturally go through it and start nymphing it. I would try to work it as delicately as you can and keep out of the vision of the trout so that you have, a, you have maybe multiple chances. In this case, uh, you know, you've got a chance to do three or four different presentations over the same water and, and also have a great chance to actually hook the fish that might be there. You will be starting your guiding business as soon as uh, COVID is over. And um, I was going to say that, you know, we're so happy to have you here for it. Um, but um, he's retired, but he's not really retired. He's working on his place, folks. He's starting a guiding business. So Todd's version of um, retiring is different from mine. Fantastic. And just to build on that, I just wanted to address one thing. Um, you know, for people who are like new to the sport, just starting out and getting overwhelmed with the number of lines, number of flies, number of things to tie, what, what, what do you tell them when you take them out? If you get, a, if you get somebody who's a newbie or, just, or it's just, just getting into it within the last, let's say, zero to six months? Uh, tip, typically, I would tell them to read, watch YouTube. When I started fly fishing, uh, YouTube didn't exist. Same with a lot of you, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, I've got stacks of books. I've got stacks of magazines that would go from the floor to the ceiling, which thankfully my wife encouraged me to throw away and donate some to the school clubs. And uh, But you, you, you digest, you, you try to take in what you can. Uh, but somebody who's new, don't be so overwhelmed. Maybe just pick one technique and work on it, whether it's going to be maybe working with a sinking line spend your first season working with a sinking line or maybe with a floating line uh, have have maybe both it would be a better suggestion a sinking line and a floating line and just play with them have fun with it uh, there's no pressure if you don't catch fish just just take it as a learning experience and uh, maybe understand what you might want to do for next time uh, one thing that i did frequently and i still do is after i go for a day of fishing or especially when it's a competition i'll write myself a letter like what what would i have done differently what should i have done differently and then some sometimes i'll pull that letter out like in the case of for me for as a competition angler if i'm going to go to a competition and and i know that i'm going to be in the boat and i'm anticipating it's going to be tough which it always is uh, I'll write myself a letter. It's it's called kind of what I call a letter to Todd. But uh, you basically it's a thing of encouragement, whether it's on my phone or on a piece of paper. And it's basically so that if I'm struggling, I can pull it out and I can read it real quickly, and it'll tell me, "Did you try this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Uh, maybe try this sort of." Uh, uh, thing here to, to try and get some success. And what that does is even for people who are angling, uh, you, you can get in that sort of that mental block. It's almost like a writer's block. It's where you just don't know what to do. You're fishing, you're not having success. And then as you get home, you're driving on your way home. You're like, oh, I forgot all about that pattern. I should have done this or, oh, you know, you, you kick yourself because you know that you didn't do something that should have worked. But when you're in the sort of the heat of the battle, as you'd call it, and you're not having success, you, you can get into that panic stage where you start wondering, what, why aren't they biting? What could happen? But in this case, I'll pull up my little note. I'll read it. Okay. Uh, is there any sort of hatches going on? You know, just stuff that was, it's a basic reminder to tell you to slow down, pause and reflect. But this letter will give you some information that you might have written up the night before or the week before or a year before. When you had clarity, you had an open mind, you weren't in a panic state. Uh, other thing that I really should to add to this is it's very important recreationally, but especially for as a competitive angler, is to make sure nutrition and hydration is looked after when you're on the water fishing. Uh, I think we've all done that where you fished and you haven't drank enough water. 
you come off and you're, you realize, hey, I didn't have to even pee once today. Well, that's a bad thing. That's not a good thing. Um, in this case, being dehydrated, uh, talk to any, any athlete, Olympic or any athlete that, that does any sort of sport that's physical where it involves perspiration. Uh, if you're dehydrated, your mind does not work right. You do not function right. You do not think right. You're more emotional. I'm sure you've all done that too, or you've had that. Uh, but in the case of, of that note, having my letter, it allows me to pull it out and think back to when I had a clear mind, what was going on. But again, so you want to make sure you carry water. Uh, I carry a life straw when I'm on the river. I don't know if you've seen those, but it's a little purification thing. So you can drink the water out of the river without uh, carrying a, a jug of water with you. Because if you're hiking and working on a river, the amount of perspiration and water loss is significant. And again, this can lead to that uh, inability to make those, those, those clear thoughts. So to get around it, that's sort of my backup plan is to have that little letter to Todd so I can pull it out and I can actually have that ability, even though my might not be working right at that time, to read something that I'm telling myself when I did have clarity. The other important thing is to, uh, is to have a pattern, establish a pattern when you're fishing. Either if you're in a boat or else you're, if you're on a river, stick to a pattern and don't just stand still. If, if, you're in a, if, if you're in one pool and not getting anywhere, then take a few steps one side, but develop a pattern. <laughs> exactly. You know, and that's a great point you brought up. Um, what, what, uh, with, with lakes, and it's no different with lakes as it is with rivers, you're going to find different lies where the trout are sitting and you may pick up the aggressive fish. Uh, but if you stand there all day in that same pool, there's only so many aggressive fish that are in there unless they're on a major feed. So that's why you tend to move around on rivers. You would go and try different holes or different lies or find different structure. Lakes are no different. Uh, I see it here in BC. It's a common thing. People throw down double anchors. They sit in one spot for hours and they'll cast this one area. Well, if you've ever watched from above with a drone or even a high vantage point, fish scatter and move around. When they see the constant slapping of the water, they, they tend to move away from that or around it. They kind of avoid it. Um, but there are aggressive fish. So on a lake, if you've caught fish in one area, this is where lock style is effective, where you're drifting and moving and covering new water at all times. You're picking off those aggressive fish here and there so you're not necessarily just sitting there waiting for a fish to come to you you're actually drifting towards them so again it's a good point is that a lot of lake anglers forget about that and they tend to just anchor up in one spot it can be great for a while but you can have better success by covering water going to new spots and pulling up and moving when i do fish lock style which for those of you who don't know it's just basically from a free drifting boat casting ahead of the drift and covering water. When I do fish lock style, I'll fish through an area. If I do find something where there's major activity, recreationally, I'll drop the anchors and fish it for a bit. Then I'll pull up and I'll move when it slows down. So uh, sometimes the success of certain people can be attributed to the fact that they're covering new water and thus new fish. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your insight. Um, I, I, especially that last one about going home at 6 p.m. You know, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and uh, listen, we're going to have you back again, 100%. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate your time for listening to me. And uh, yeah. I hope some of you will come out to BC. And those of you that are out here, especially the guy in Kelowna, I'd love to fish with you because uh, my, my daughter's gone away to the RCMP, so I lost my fishing partner. So. <laughs>